Hi. On February 9, something happened that made the scientific community globally sit up and take notice. The Jet Lab, which stands for Joint European Taurus Laboratory at uh, Culham near Oxford, announced that uh, they had uh, achieved breakthrough in nuclear fusion. Now, nuclear fusion, as most people know, is something that happens in the sun and in the stars all the time and if we can get that to happen on earth in our world it can provide practically limitless amounts of clean energy perhaps very cheaply also but we are still a distance away the entire process of uh, the technology of nuclear fusion is still in the making but then the UK scientists announced a major breakthrough and now because of this, we now look at what this nuclear fusion is all about and why that is so important and what kind of a milestone is this. Now, most people know, basically have a basic understanding of what nuclear fusion is, which is uh, energy is created by fusing or merging two atomic or subatomic particles. Uh, when this happens, a little bit, little bit of matter, mass gets destroyed and it gets converted into energy. We are all familiar with nuclear fission where an atom is split, it's broken, split open by the bombardment of neutrons and here again some matter get destroyed, not destroyed, gets converted into enormous amount of energy. But nuclear fission as we all know has a lot of lots of problems uh, related to radioactivity and disposal of radio waste and so on, uh, radioactive wastes and so on. Therefore, nuclear fusion is something that is very much coveted. Now, but the problem here is how to get two subatomic particles to fuse. Now, imagine you have, let's say, a small ball of dough, of dough in each hand. Now, how do you fuse them? You simply bring them together, merge them, squeeze them together, they become one. Now, in the case of subatomic, subatomic particles like protons, how do you do it? The only way to do it is to smash one into another with tremendous force so that they merge into one or fuse into one. This is the principle and most people have a good understanding of what uh, the principle underlying scientific principle in nuclear fusion is. But below this broad understanding, there are lots of very, very interesting, highly interesting, uh, fascinating things about nuclear fusion. And in this video, we want to take a look at some of them. So the question is how to fuse two subatomic particles. Let's, let's take it step by step. First of all, you need these two atomic particles. For that, what scientists usually do is to take the simplest, the first of all elements, which is hydrogen. Hydrogen, uh, as we all know, uh, is a very peculiar atom in that it has no neutrons. It has one proton and one electron around it. Now, there are isotopes of hydrogen. Isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons, different new, more or less neutrons. So, there are two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium which has one neutron and tritium which has two neutrons. Now, the idea is to take deuterium and tritium atoms and force them to squeeze, squeeze them into one. Uh, why do we why do they take deuterium and tritium and not just two atoms of hydrogen because when you use deuterium and tritium the energy production is higher so they take a gas hydrogen gas of deuterium and tritium and then make a plasma out of it now what is plasma plasma is the fourth state of matter that is we all know of solids liquids and gases plasma is at another state in which matter exists which is in the form of uh, you know throbbing soup of electrons and protons just electrons and protons not attached to each other in an atom but electrons that have got ripped away from the parent atoms and they are floating around in the space there are electrons and then protons and it's like a very throbbing vibrating soup and this happens you create plasma by superheating a gas so to get fusion happen, the first thing that you do is to take 
a, take plasma and then heat it further so that you energize these subatomic particles and when they are energized they keep moving all around at very very high speeds and then some of them collide into each other and when they do that there is a pretty good chance that they will fuse into one in the process release energy now first of all how do you create plasma now you can't simply it's not as though you can take a vessel and then put it on an oven and heat it it doesn't happen that way again heating happens only by bombardment you can use a, sometimes scientists use very very bright lasers unimaginably bright lasers the number that goes around is something like this 20000 100 watt bulbs how much light they would produce in one second now, that much light is delivered in a laser in a few billions of a second a few nanoseconds maybe 10 15 nanoseconds that much of light is from a laser it's a laser beam that's bombarded into this put into this uh, this gas this hydrogen deuterium tritium gas and then because of that uh, the, the gas gets heated up superheated and the electrons get ripped away and electrons and protons are separated and then they are all floating around in the space now when this happens plasma is created plasma as i just said now is extremely extremely hot imagine if you put it in a vessel in a chamber or after all you have to have all of these things in a chamber now what will happen to the walls of the chamber they will melt away or burn away you don't want that to happen because you are not getting any very fit there so the chamber itself is walled with the superconducting magnets the chamber in incidentally in nuclear fusion reactions resemble a donut or some of south indians may know it as vada you know as a, a, a circle a flattened circle with a hole in it a donut shaped shaped uh, vessel the walls of the vessels feature superconducting magnets capable of producing tremendous amount of magnetic field when this magnetic field is created and there is this plasma within it because of the repulsive forces the plasma does not come and bombard come and mix with the walls and therefore uh, the plasma and the walls are separate and you can have something going inside it well this is something called magnetic confinement so you have plasma and you have confined it magnetically in a chamber now imagine in this chamber the plasma is moving at tremendous speed now you need to heat it further to get them collide further there are several techniques so for heating this plasma further scientists employ a few techniques one of them is for example again bombarding it with high frequency electromagnetic waves so anyway let's not worry too much too much about it there are you know very very high frequency maybe of the range of gamma waves uh, electromagnetic waves are put into that and uh, because of the high frequency and if, because you have like you know waves on the seashore dashing against waves of the sea dashing against the seashore uh, you have waves dashing against these particles and that uh, that energy uh, provides further momentum to these particles and then they collide and when they collide they fuse and when they fuse they release energy now the question is uh, you already are putting in a hell of a lot of heat to produce heat now what is the big deal if you already have heat energy that is what fine the end product is also energy input is also energy the whole idea is that as long as you get more energy out of the system than what you put in there is an economic gain that is what nuclear fusion is all about and to achieve for fusion to happen you have to raise the temperature inside the chamber to something like 150 million degrees celsius which is about 10 times as hot as the core of the sun now why is this why are we so getting so excited about this why is this considered clean energy it is considered clean energy because a it does not pollute b it does not importantly does not produce any greenhouse gas and there is nothing radioactive here unlike uh, fission well tritium is radioactive but then tritium pretty soon decays into something called an isotope of helium called helium 3 so tritium 
is radioactive but it can be handled it's not so difficult to get rid of it so you have three main advantages one is it's non polluting it doesn't produce any greenhouse gases it's not radioactive so it's a lot easier to handle and on top of these things the basic material that you need the fuels that you need for this which is deuterium and tritium are easily obtainable like i said uh, deuterium uh, which is which is what which is a stuff of heavy water which we use in atomic uh, in fission reactors also as a moderator deuterium is something that can be separated from sea water so you it, you can produce deuterium very cheaply tritium of course you have to manufacture uh, there is a process of manufacturing it however the tritium itself can be manufactured or bred inside this inside this chamber because if you if you line the chamber or blanket the chamber with uh, lithium uh, the neutrons you remember deuterium and tritium i said have neutrons unlike uh, non iset unlike hydrogen which doesn't have any neutrons these two have neutrons so what happens to those neutrons the neutrons get thrown away and because they don't have any charge they are not repelled by this magnetic field so they go and crash or bombard crash against the walls of the of the chamber and it causes no damage there it simply gets absorbed in the in the by the walls but if we have lithium lined a blanket of lithium lithium on the walls that lithium absorbs the neutrons and then it gets converted into tritium so tritium can be bred as as this reaction is happening you can make more and more tritium you could take the separate the tritium and put it back into the into the into the uh, reactor so deuterium getting deuterium is no problem obtaining tritium is not a big problem they don't result in any uh, polluting or radioactive material and it produces enormous amounts of energy now again it's such a complex system you have to handle temperatures of 150 million degrees celsius why do we have to do all that is it worth the trouble well it is worth the trouble because for example if you run a 1000 megawatts or 1 gigawatt of coal power plant that would need something like 2.5 to 2.7 million tons of coal every year but for a nuclear fusion reactor of an equivalent capacity you would need 125 kilograms of deuterium and another 125 kilograms of tritium something like that so with such small quantities you can produce enormous amounts of energy and once your uh, reactor is paid off and infinite amount of very very cheap energy that is the importance of nuclear fusion we are a few decades away from commercializing nuclear fusion as we speak one major international collaborative experimental reactor is coming up in france it's called iter reactor it's coming up in southern france uh, it's a collaboration of 35 countries including india and uh, uh, and lnt of india has supplied some very critical parts huge mammoth cryostats uh, cryostats are basically refrigerators imagine the size something like 30 meters across 30 meters high that big stainless steel some stuff made of stainless steel they supplied uh, that cryostat in 2000 in june 2020 to this reactor so it's a global effort that reactor is coming up and uh, uh, the recent announcement in the uk has really charged things up in that scientific community they are all very happy because now that a milestone has been reached with the learnings of this J, jet jet lab in the uk uh, uh, they will be able to speed and make things faster in iter france how far are we from obtaining commercial amounts of electric from a commercial nuclear fusion reactor well, at the moment it is still a well, quite a distance away perhaps a few decades away but then imagine uh, the problems that you are fighting are climate change and the pro- problem of provision of uh, clean cheap energy to billions of people and the population of the world is growing anyway by 2050 the population will be 9 billion you have to provide clean energy to so many people uh, and you have to fight with whatever all with all the means that you have you have to fight climate change now against this backdrop a few decades is but a wink in time so it's all worth it